But I have in front of me the top three pieces of good news in 2021. And this is written by Juan Cole, and, and I saw this at uh, Common Dreams website. Um, and Juan starts out with, with, with a truism that I discovered working in broadcast all the years that I have, and that is that, you know, the corporations that put out news, however you want to define that, uh, they, they think the good news doesn't sell. And in fact, for the most part, it doesn't. Uh, it may relieve some terrible, terrible anxieties or, or calm one down, but it doesn't sell. You, you don't have commercials behind a good news station. I remember here in Atlanta, oh, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 years ago, maybe more than that, the uh, NBC affiliate decided, the local NBC affiliate decided they were going to be the good news station. And they're going to stop covering uh, reports about shootings and fires and earthquakes and death and destruction and war and poverty and hunger and famine, you know, and they were going to report on all the good things in Atlanta. Well, that lasted about, oh, I don't know, maybe one Arbitron book, which would be about three months, Arbitron being the rating uh, uh, system. Well, no, uh, which is it? Well, that's radio. Is it? Oh, whatever. One ratings book. And then the... Uh, the owners of the, of the station realized this is not going to work. So they went back to the mud and the sludge and the gore and the blood that is uh, newscasting. But that's why you see so little good news on television or on the front page of news websites. And as one Cole points out, executives at for-profit news believe their corporations benefit just as media platforms do, by the way, social media platforms, from provoking your fight or flight reflexes. In other words, make you angry or afraid, one of the two. Because it's the adrenaline rush that occurs when that happens. It keeps you reading or watching and, of course, coming back for more. Talk about bad drugs. Um. The news directors think that bad news is addictive. And in, in a very real way, it is. It is to the point that the editors and journalists seem to feel they have to cast Biden in a bad light, unfairly, to keep their viewers. That's one example. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago about why is Biden reported on with such negative headlines, no matter what he does. So... The news directors, uh, Juan Cole says they may be right. Well, I know for a fact that they are right because I've worked in that business. I worked at radio, television, CNN, and, and I've worked in news as well as, uh, you know, talk radio and uh, journalism, so on and so forth. So, um, no, Juan Cole, it's not they may be right. They are right. And they are. But good news, as Juan Cole points out, can also provoke enzyme responses. It can raise the level of dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin and endorphins and yada, 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 make you feel better. That's true. And a lot of times, uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but a lot of times when you see a good news story, what is your first reaction? You get tears in your eyes, right? Because it's so unusual to begin with. And you're so relieved. <laughs> I know this is true with me. Oh my God, good news. Oh, look. It's like a warm kitten. So all those um, uh, enzymes are redu uh, uh, released and it makes you feel good. Um, for example, reading or hearing about love or successful struggles against uh, what might have been an uh, almost um, unovercomable situation or making connections with uh, uh, emotions like gratitude or altruism creativity. All that makes people feel good. And in theory, could attract eyeballs, get people to watch or read. But, uh, well, mm, we're not um, for profit, Juan Cole writes. Uh, this came from his, uh, his uh, website, Informed Comment. And he writes, since we're not for profit at Informed Comment, they're not primarily after clicks. They're just going to report some stuff. 
So Juan says, I'm going to tell some good news stories to offset the panic rained down on us by our television sets. Here's what won't be in the headlines as 2021 ends. Well, first of all, the jobs report. Um, One of the uh, regulars at MSNBC explained that in mid-January of this year, unemployment claims were 886,000 a week. Remember that? It was just shocking. And this year, a week before Christmas, jobless claims were 198,000. 90% drop almost, 75, 80% drop. That's a decline of 8,000 from the week before. In other words, two weeks before Christmas. So in December of this year, jobless claims hit a 52-year low. And I, I wouldn't have known that had I not picked up this article by Juan Cole at Common Dreams. When the pandemic hit in the spring of 2020, jobless claims skyrocketed to 7 million. Remember that? It, it was just scary. Uh, it was like, for example, in terms of population, it was like all of Tennessee or Arizona suddenly unemployed and looking for help on a weekly basis. That big a population, all of Tennessee every week unemployed, that many people. Last week, it was, if you want to use the states, the population of the states as a a basis of comparison, last week it was less than half the population of Wyoming or a third the population of Vermont. By the way, those are the least populous states. So the Biden recovery... The Biden economy, regarding joblessness anyway, has improved on the pre-pandemic situation. And a lot of people who are still unemployed, I'm sure you've been following these stories, and I don't know if this would qualify as negative reporting or not, but so many people have just said, you know, I'm not going to, I'm just not interested in working right now. I'm not going to take that job. I'm not going to work for $8 an hour or ten fifty or or 13 or 14 I'm worth more than that. So screw it. So that's where some of the unemployment is coming from. Then there's poverty. Now, like Juan Cole said, he's got three things here. All right, the second one is poverty. And the, the reality is, in this country that should have certain aspects of it that are strong in its democratic socialism, and we're terrified of the phrase, but because of government help, socialism, Poverty was lower in the United States, both in 2020 and 2021. The poverty rate in 2020 was 16, roughly 16 percent of of our population lived in poverty. Um, By the way, the uh, the standard definition of poverty is a family of four living on less than twenty six thousand five hundred dollars a year. Could you do that? If You had a family of four. Jesus, God. Uh, reports are that the poverty rate fell further in 2021 in some months to as little as 9%. And that included child poverty, which we all should just be horrifically ashamed of in this country. Child poverty, for God's sake. Now, those programs that provided this advance in fighting poverty Remember back in the, uh, you may be old enough to remember the war on poverty during the Lyndon Johnson presidency, the war on poverty, which just crashed and burned. And one of the reasons it did was because it was poorly organized and the right wing in this country, even back in the 60s, were going to have none of it. So anyway, the, the programs that enabled this advance in fighting poverty in the past two years mostly just expired. So 2022 is going to be rough in more ways than one. I I just dread what's coming this year. I really do. Um, But the the reality is there are a lot more jobs around right now. And many are are paying a higher wage because of a so-called worker shortage. It's not that we're lacking people. It's just that we're lacking people who say, okay, I'll go to work for $9 an hour. 
I mean, to hell with that. To hell with that. So, but it is good news that for the past couple of years, fewer Americans have had to grapple with poverty. For real. But you won't find a whole lot of reporting on that. And then the third thing that uh, Juan Cole brings up is renewable energy. Um, this is what he reports. CNBC reports that India reached its 2030 goal of getting 40% of its electricity from low carbon sources last year, nine years early. How about that? India. It has gone gangbusters with solar energy in particular and now has 48.55 gigawatts of solar power and nearly as much wind power. Cole goes on to write, India has almost as much solar power as it does hydropower. So 40% by 2030 was the pledge that India made at the Paris Climate Agreement six years ago, 2015. And it got there in six years, not 15. India made it. Now, if India can do that, why can't it just go to 100% on a similarly advanced timetable? Well, there's a reason for that, and that is that India um, is stuck with a lot of coal power. But the renewables, the renewable energy sources are falling in, in price so fast that the future is clear. I, I would be so glad when coal just stays in the earth and not in, in just India or Russia or China, but here too. Just, I mean, we, 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 just, we just don't get it, do we? <laughs> so what Juan writes is the future just needs to get here sooner than the Modi government expected. And it's showing signs of doing that. Modi being um, the prime minister of India, of course. And just to prove it's possible, Uruguay. Uruguay. When's the last time you heard anything about Uruguay? Other than the fact that a bunch of Nazis fled there after World War II. Or was that Paraguay? I can never tell the difference between those two countries. I'm sorry. Uruguay gets nearly 100% of its electricity from renewables. And how about Scotland? Scotland, which just installed the first 10 megawatt deep sea offshore wind turbine. And they got 114 of them planned. There will be a wind farm equivalent to a small nuclear plant for the power it puts out when, when all 114 of these are completed. Wind power. And God knows there is all of a sudden an abundance of wind, to put it ridiculously, right? So certain observers keep saying that while we're putting in renewables at an unprecedented rate, it isn't fast enough to keep the earth from continuing on this suicidal track, this global warming track. But Juan Cole says that what he notices is that we are not looking at a serial progression here. The rate is accelerating. It's an algorithm. This is not a reason to be complacent. But we have to take heart from the old, from the real achievements that are being accomplished in the area of, of controlling global warming. People are meeting deadlines all of a sudden, as in India and Scotland, that had been scoffed at, and often by people like your humble and obedient servant here, me, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. And the fact that they are meeting these, these projections, these deadlines on time, uh, is, is astonishing. And what's even more so is some of these uh, targets are being met early. As Juan Cole points out, the, the, the global warming is going to continue. But if we can just reduce the rate, if we can just keep reducing it until eventually it's, it's just math. If you keep reducing the rate of increase, eventually it's no longer increase. 
or it may be increased on such an infinitesimal level that it doesn't matter. Right? Does that make sense? So, without getting into ten cent philosophy here, we, we, we all agree, I think, that life, every aspect of life is a real challenge. And God knows we have some challenges coming. But that's always true. There's always challenges, right? There's always something. There's always one more thing that you forgot to do. There's always a challenge. But Juan Cole says, quote, by recognizing the genuine good news all around, we take heart and find our Zen. That doesn't mean we turn away from the problems. Um, obviously, scientific research has shown that optimists are better problem solvers than pessimists. And, and I certainly agree with that. I confronted with a problem, my pessimism just takes over. And I hate that. And I struggle against it, but I haven't been very successful at that. But optimists uh, are better problem solvers because they are convinced that there is a way to solve the problem. And that's what motivates optimists to keep trying to keep pushing forward. So the bottom line, if there's a bottom line to this, just keep trying in the year coming. And, and God knows I agree with that. I, 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 I do. I'm, I'm not ready to just throw up my hands and wander into the woods, although I've often thought about that. And I've mentioned in this, in this podcast a couple of times. But to what end? I mean, seriously, what... What would that accomplish? And I'm one of, what, 7 billion almost? Or maybe it's more than 7 billion on the planet now. So my wandering into the woods is just bullshit. I, I mean, eh, what if everybody wandered into the woods, right? Just to escape. So anyway, I don't have a message for um, 2022. I, I really don't. It, it's the year my last child graduates high school and goes on to university. And that's a significant milestone for me. Um, but as far as a message, nah, I don't have any. Um, the only message I would have, if, if this is not a message, it's more like a salutation or a greeting. And that would be, uh, you know, I hope things are as untroubling for you as, as, as possible. Hi, Truth Seekers. Mike Malloy here. As you know, we've switched formats and are now broadcast exclusively on the Progressive Voices Network. So that means you get fewer program interruptions, no corporate commercials, and lots of profanity. But our format change also means some of our radio listeners no longer hear the program. It's been a while since I mentioned our podcasts, so you may have forgotten that there is a way to listen to this program anytime you need a good dose of screaming. Visit MikeMalloy.com and subscribe to our podcast. As a podcast subscriber, you can download the program to your mobile device and take me with you wherever you go. And if you have a friend who needs a dose of truth-seeking, you can give a gift subscription as well. That's MikeMalloy.com and never miss a minute of the uncensored fun and frivolity.